Good evening. I'm Mercedes Ruhl. I know some of you have to leave, but I'd like to present the director of this film for a brief tete-a-tete, -tete, Kiyami Karasawa. Well, that was a kick in the pants. <laughs> kick somewhere. Uh, there, uh, there's something so uh, astoundingly vulnerable that comes through in this film about this seemingly invulnerable performer. Um, when she was doing Everything's Coming Up Roses, I thought to myself, there's only uh, Elaine Stritch and Mick Jagger, and then there's everybody else, you know? Uh, tell her that one. Yeah, <laughs> do. <laughs> She's gonna say, "Who's Mick Jagger?" That's right. <laughs> um, so tell me how you, how you conceived of this project, how it began, what was its provenance, what, how, did, how did it all germinate? Um, I actually didn't know that much about Elaine before I uh, I worked with. I was a script supervisor for many years in feature film and television. And um, I worked with her briefly on the set of Romance and Cigarettes, which my friend John Turturro was directing. Mm -hmm. And I still remember the day she came in, she was like this crazy hurricane. And you know, when you're a script supervisor, you're in charge of dialogue and continuity and all this stuff, and she would just blow into the scene with James Gandolfini, and every single take would be completely different. <laughs> and so I said to John, you know, at the, at the monitor, I said, what would you like me to do? <laughs> she hasn't said a single line correctly. She hasn't copied you know, any of the blocking that we rehearsed. And he goes, look, she's Elaine Stritch. You just got to let her go. And that was my introduction to her. And several years later, I'm sitting in my hairdresser, and I look in the mirror, and I see this lady walk to the wash basin. And I said, is that Elaine Stritch? And my hairdresser went, yeah, she's a longtime client of mine. And, I, and then he said to me a few minutes later, he said, you know, you should be making a documentary about her. Because by that time, I was producing documentaries. And I, I thought about it, and I went home, and I Googled her, and I YouTubed her, and I thought, holy shit, he's right. <laughs> she's an amazing character. And I was sort of embarrassed that I didn't know more about her because she's such a legend in theater. But not only that, she has this incredible, unique, uh, I mean, there's nobody like her. You know, she's a broad, she's yeah. a dame, she's, you know, all of those things. So I, you know, I sort of, my hairdresser arranged for us to kind of connect uh -huh. in the salon. <laughs> and um, it took a couple of months for her to kind of, you know, to kind of want to want to do it. But it was, yeah, it was a courtship. And then finally she agreed. Hairdressers should get 10 percent, <laughs> you know. Exactly. Well, because he's my they, associate they, producer. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, a, a lot of art would never have happened without hairdressers. That's true. That's how, true. How did, uh, did she agree to do it right away? Did she like the idea? Did she trust you right away? Uh, I, no. no. I mean, it was, it was you know, how I, she was very, um, uh, she was very flattered initially, and she kept saying, oh, that's a great idea. I love the idea. You know, and then every time I approach her, she'd go, not now, not uh -huh. today. Uh -huh. And then she'd say, why don't you call me in the spring? <laughs> and, and then I'd say, well, you're doing Little Night Music. It would be great if we could film that. And she'd say, hold it. I don't think I can do that, you know. Uh. So it was kind of like this bittersweet courtship. And finally, I had a, the hairdress, uh, the owner of the hairdressing salon ha arranged a <laughs> dinner party and sat me next to Rob Bowman, her musical director. And we had a lovely conversation. And finally, I think Rob must have talked to her because I get this call at 2 a.m., <laughs> on, my, on my office answering machine, and, and, and she, said, she said, listen, it's Elaine Stritch. I can't pronounce your name. <laughs> but I hear wonderful things about you, and I would, love, I would love to do this film. So why don't you call me so we can talk about it? And then we just started shooting. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And how did, how did she feel about being followed around in the big moments, the small moments, the intimate ones, the performing ones? She, you were... <laughs> You were yeah, with we were her. How did she feel about that? Well, I think, I think just like our relationship developed, um, she, she grew more and more comfortable. And I kept the crew very small. It was just myself and a cameraman. Um, and initially, she, she performed quite a bit of her life. Uh -huh. and, and we had, had to get beyond that, you know? 
And with that, the English muffin scene where she's directing my cameraman, uh. <laughs> that was in the early stages um, because I, uh. that was the one day I couldn't be there. I was opening a film in Toronto. And so, unfortunately, I, she, I said, listen, Elaine, I can't, I'm in Toronto, I can't be there. And she goes, that's okay. And I said, do you mind if I just send my cameraman to be a fly on the wall, follow you around during rehearsal and whatever you do after? She said, sure, send him in. Uh. And then later that night, I get a call from this guy, sh and he said, I, I don't think it went very well. <laughs> and then I saw the dailies, and I thought, oh my God, it's like sending a lamb to slaughter. You know, this poor guy is being ordered around for two and a half hours. And then um, it worked in the movie, though, because it's kind of like what we went through in the beginning. She thought she needed to direct everything around her, and then yeah. finally, as she and I grew closer, she just liked having us around and telling us stories and becoming very comfortable. And I think that's a progression that you see in the film as well. She's, you know, I mean, the other side of those dialogues is me telling her about what was going on in my life, which was no small thing. I was having, you know, a lot of family and personal crises, and she was very receptive to hearing all of that and sharing a lot of her life. So it was I, a progression. There is a real <laughs> feeling that there was an intimacy that developed between you two to the point where she felt um, safe enough with you to open up her, a very deep part of her heart and her fear. Yeah. That was astounding. Yeah. Because she, I think inside every tough cookie, and I've <laughs> been called one, inside every tough cookie there is this very, very vulnerable, as, as uh, who was it says in the film? There is this little Catholic schoolgirl in there still mm -hmm. somewhere. Somewhere. Those yeah. prayers on the steps were no, amazing. No, absolutely, absolutely. So, what did she finally feel? Did she she seen the whole film? What was her take on the whole film? Um, <laughs> when I, I first showed her a cut on my laptop on her bed, you know, I sat with her and we kind of watched this thing, and she thought it was fantastic. Actually, yeah, yeah. she said, "I look adorable in that <laughs> entire movie." <laughs> and, um, and then we saw, I showed her a locked cut in front of a small audience just so I could see it projected on a screen. And when she saw it with people in the room, I don't think they were expecting for her to be there. So they were pretty sedate because oh, they thought, oh my dear. God, she's here. Oh, she's dear, looking over yeah. my shoulder. And, and when, after they all left, she said, I think, I, think, I think a lot of things have to change. Oh. And I thought, oh my God, yeah. <laughs> I've done the wrong thing, you know? And then she proceeded to sort of give me a litany of things that she would change. And number one being, she needed to be in more costumes in the movie. Like, why didn't I have her in this wardrobe? And why didn't I have her in this wardrobe? And, yeah. you know, um, and she got very self-conscious about it. And, and I, you know, tried to explain with, to her that we had already locked picture and we had been accepted at Tribeca Film Festival and we were sort of moving along yeah. with the scoring yeah. and everything. And she, I would get these calls and she was still very upset about it. And um, thank God for Julie Keys. I don't know if she's still in the audience. Um, but she's a very close friend of Elaine's. And she said, listen, she's going to come around. As soon as it's well received, she's going to come around. Right, right. And so I was biting my nails. And we were doing these interviews with the press where you know, they'd ask her how she felt about the film. And she'd give these really like, not very positive <laughs> reactions. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I thought, oh my God, how are we going to promote this movie? And at the premiere for Tribeca, we got this 10 minute standing ovation and she and I were walking down the aisle to take the stage and she grabbed my arm and she goes, thank you, it's much better. <laughs> I think she thought I had took her advice but I actually didn't change anything in the movie. <laughs> well, we all look adorable on a small screen. On, uh, on an iPhone, we look our best. <laughs> but on a big screen, with a few other strangers in the room, it can get pretty scary. I, I think it was really terrifying, but I think what was most terrifying was for her, for her to be perceived not as a performer, but as herself, yeah. you know? Yeah. And I think that n now she loves sitting in an audience um, watching the movie because she cannot believe that people are responding to her as a person yeah. as well as they are, yeah. you know? Yeah. And I think it means a, lot, a great deal to her. Um, and now, now, she is living at home with, with her family mm -hmm. in Michigan. How is, she, uh, how is she making that transition? How is it going? Um, it was very awkward in the beginning because I think she thought, you know, I think she thought that, that it was going to be this wonderful, easy transition into, you know, a, a very, she bought a really beautiful condo that you saw her 
touring in in Birmingham and it's a beautiful community and it's kind of like this, you know, it's kind of like yeah. the Hamptons a little bit. Yeah. Um, but she was totally bored. You know, there's, there weren't people calling her up and inviting her to, you know, Broadway shows and, and, and she didn't have the doorman or the bellhop whenever she needed anything. And it took her a while to get used to the various caregivers that didn't know who she was or didn't care who she was, you know. So I think that it was a lot of adjusting, but now that she's made some friends, I think it's, it's really nice for her to, to have the full-time care and appreciate, you know, that whole aspect of it. But it's a different pace. Yeah. So, so I think she's, she's slowly, you know, transitioning. But we were just at the Michael Moore Film Festival in Traverse City last weekend together. I know she really wanted to be here, and she's sorry that she can't be here, but she fell down and broke her pelvis on Wednesday. Um, you know, but she still like looks forward to to all the new dates with the film, and you know she wants to be still part of the action. So what what do you think her legacy is going to be? Um, not just well, in, she she's a, she's a legend. She's a Broadway legend, and this film has has sort of brought her to a larger, uh, uh, not a larger audience so much as. She's a larger archetype uh -huh. because of this film, and I don't know how much, you know, well, how many hours of footage you you had, but you took a great narrative out of it. You formed a great narrative out of it. Thanks. What do you think? Uh, what do you think people are going to remember her for? Well, it's interesting that you should say that. I I would actually really like to know. <laughs> After making the film, you know. Following her for a year and a half, I could have made 14 different films about her yeah. because she's so complex and entertaining and there's so many engaging aspects of her character. But I just, I think she's a survivor, you know? Yeah. I really believe that she's a survivor and she's sort of carved her own niche. And she's, you know, she, there's nobody like her. Yeah. And she had to accept herself for the talent that she had and, and have the courage enough to put it up there. So yeah. I just consider her, you know, such a brave and unique individual. And just as a woman, uh, you know, I don't think there's anybody like her. No, no. She's, uh, she's a quintessential entertainer. And yeah. she does, as someone said in the film, bring us back, root us back to the golden age of theater. An amazing creature. She's a creature. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> does anybody else have any questions? I want to open this to the audience a little bit. Not a single question. Uh, they're out there. Yeah. Um, those scenes where she's more delicate and uh, sensitive and, and sick and doesn't feel well and, uh, or is having a, a diabetic episode, um, did, did she, she have any problem revealing that or did she? Say anything about no, that I don't look good there. I don't want, or what, she, she just let it all hang out. No, she has no reservations about being totally honest about herself and what she's going through. And uh, I remember being really nervous when we shot her in the ho you know, in the uh, hospital bed. Um, you know, she has her rollers on and her gown on, <laughs> and she said, "I look pretty damn good, <laughs> considering what I was going through." You know, and it's weird because she sort of watches this like a narrative film. Like she got scared when we were in the Hamptons and she was watching herself have the attack and she grabbed my hand and she goes, I don't know if I can watch this. What's going to happen? <laughs> and I said, well, you know what happens. <laughs> it works out. And she's like, oh, thank God. <laughs> so, yeah, she doesn't have that sort of self-consciousness about herself that, that the rest of us do. Yes. I was very lucky to know uh, Elaine and got to know her quite well. I'd copied with her frequently when she lived in the harbor. And uh, she is no different, uh, for real, than she is on the stage. She's a fantastic person, and I do wish her well, and I'm sure everybody here wishes her get well. And I would like you to find out her address, because there are thousands of people who would like to send her a get well card. Do you want it right now? Yes, <laughs> It's 280 Harmon Street, Birmingham, Michigan. Apartment 172. <laughs> I'm sure somebody can get that to you later. <laughs>
And I don't think she'd mind you giving. No, no, no. Actually, it was either. just in Liz Smith's new column, The Social Diary. For some reason, they published her address. Uh, anyone else have a question? Yes? Is that Ellen? Oh. Ellen Adler, Ellen. ladies Ellen. and gentlemen, from the Stella Adler Studio, is here Ellen. in our audience. And Elaine studied acting with Stella. She studied acting with my mother. Yeah. Yeah, right. One thing, when she was young, Elaine was a very heavy, heavy drinker. You know that. And at one point, she took herself, pulled herself together. She did the 12 steps, and she stopped drinking, except one a day. But yeah. she had that courage to just say, I'm going to do it. And she sat in those meetings with those people, and, and then one a day. She did, um, for 24 years, stop drinking. It was only the year before we started shooting that she started her one a day. Her one a day, one a day. Does anyone do one a day? I have to tell you, this, I have to tell you the one, she studied with my mother at the same time as, Mar as Brando did. And she, uh, they talked on the phone or something and he said, there's one thing I want from you, Elaine. She said, what is it? She said, silence. <laughs> <laughs> what did you think of yourself in the film, Ellen? This is the first time you've seen it, right? I was very intrigued with my hair. I don't like the way it looks. <laughs> <laughs> it looks wonderful tonight. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Good to see you, Ellen. So we, have, we have time for one more. Yes. Thank you for asking that. Um, we, we actually premiered it at the Tribeca Film Festival and we had several offers. It was sold to IFC, Sundance Selects, who released the Joan Rivers documentary. And it's gonna open in um, 15 theaters uh, across the nation in February 2014. So tell your friends about it if you can. I'll close with a quick little story. I was doing The Goat, Edward Albee's The Goat on Broadway, and Elaine came to see the show early on, and she came backstage, and she finally made it to my dressing room, and she sat down on a couch, and there was a coffee table in front of it, and she took a big packet of papers out, and she laid them all out, and she got some bills, and she lined them up, and she got out a checkbook, and she got a, I think she had some kind of thing to add with, the, and. And she just started doing, and, and, and I'm thinking, that they're going to close the theater. And, and I said, um, Elaine, Elaine, and uh, she said, wait, wait, wait. And she was just finishing things up, and she, you know, she just didn't, she had her glasses on. And finally I said, Elaine, they're going to close the theater. We, we have to go. The, the doorman wants to go home. And she looked up, and she went, oh, 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 all right. And so she gathered up all her papers, and she put them together, and she, and she took off her glasses, and she stood up, straightened herself out, went to the door, and said, Oh, you were good, kid. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a pleasure. Look, there's a couple of people I think in the audience that I'd like to thank. Is Elizabeth Hammerdinger here? My, one of my producers? No, 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 she's not here. Okay, uh, I would love to thank Alec Baldwin who came in on the 12th hour. He found us through the Indiegogo campaign that we started and became my executive producer. And also Julie Keyes is here, um, Elaine's friend who's in the movie, who's become a very good friend of mine without whom I probably couldn't have lived the last two years of making this film. Thank you so much all for coming. It's a great pleasure. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Thank you very much.